Two decades after the Cinderella story that catapulted him to the top, Sylvester Stallone remains a global icon. Rocky has prevailed over some very trying times. His life, which began in obscurity and was shaped by adversity, has been as dramatic as any Hollywood movie. On July 6, 1946, Sylvester Stallone was born in a charity ward at New York's Cornell Hospital. It was a difficult delivery. The doctors used forceps, which permanently damaged nerves on one side of the baby's face. The Stallones lived in a cold water flat in Hell's Kitchen, one of the grimiest parts of New York. His mother, Jackie, was an astrology buff, and she turned to the stars in Hollywood for a name. Tyrone Power was the idol of the day. Oh, yeah. So when he was born, I thought his name will be Tyrone Stallone. It rhymes so beautifully. And when they came in, I filled out the birth certificate, Tyrone Stallone. But his father, Frank, had other ideas. He wanted his firstborn to carry the name of his Sicilian grandfather. Without consulting Jackie, he changed the baby's birth certificate. And here's this long, dreadful name, Sylvester Galdenzio Stallone. So I called the Board of Health up. I said, this is the wrong name. And I was furious. But Sylvester it was. It was an early warning of how different his parents could be. Frank was an Army veteran training for a civilian job as a hairdresser. He was old-fashioned and traditional compared to Jackie, who was a beautiful young chorus girl at New York's Diamond Horseshoe Club. After the baby was born, Jackie went back to work. Sylvester was taken care of at a boarding house and returned home on weekends. The boarding house was also home to some young airline stewardesses. <laughs> and guess what? All the stewardesses fell in love with him, and they took turns keeping him in bed with them. So he had a very early orientation. <laughs> he cannot say that he wasn't loved. <laughs> Brother Frankie arrived when Sylvester was four years old, and the family moved to Silver Spring, Maryland, a comfortable suburb of Washington, D.C. The family was better off, but Sylvester had a hard time fitting in. He was a skinny, insecure little boy with a speech impediment. I think most of the kids saw him as kind of like the funny guy or the funny kid, the weird kid. Not funny, you know, from a comical, but uh, who is that guy over there, you know? He didn't have a lot of friends, to be quite honest with you. A lot of people, uh, and they made fun of his name. You know, Sylvester. Uh. So let's get rid of Sylvester. We know you don't appreciate being uh, mocked and tormented. So we're going to give you a name that denotes power, <laughs> prestige, individuality, and a hero complex. We're going to call you Binky. Now it seems like a joke, but the name came from a popular hairbrush, the Binky brush, and somehow it stuck. Through most of elementary school, Sylvester was called Binky until his classmates came up with a nasty little rhyme. Some of the kids started calling him Stinky. So uh, he did not like that name. He said, I'm, don't call me Binky anymore because you know people were calling him Stinky. So, uh, but to me, he'll always be Binky. Sylvester desperately wanted to blend in with the rest of the group. So he decided to call himself Mike, something he thought at least sounded normal. But the Stallone family would never be the picture perfect family next door. His mother's personality was too flamboyant, his father's temper too volatile. I knew that his mom and dad did not have a real strong marriage. I was always being sent home early uh, because of that. And uh, Sly had a, a very tough uh, upbringing. You know, he came from a home that uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, turmoil going on in that house. Stallone looked for escape from that turmoil and found it in Superboy comic books. He lived inside his own vivid imagination where good always triumphed over evil. He made a Superboy costume to wear under his school clothes and jumped off the roof to learn to fly. He used to love superheroes when he was growing up, and he, I remember he told me he jumped off like a 25-foot building and broke his collarbone when he was a little kid because he wanted to be a superhero. In 1958, his parents' difficult marriage ended in divorce. Puberty coincided with his search for a new role model, and Stallone found one who was larger than life. When I saw Steve Reeve take on the Roman army and lash those two chains around those columns and that extraordinary pull, it literally was a life-altering experience. The next day, I went to a junkyard 
and started lifting car parts, you know, not big ones like horns and wheels. <laughs> he made the decision to be like Steve Reeves. The vulnerable little boy who had been the target of taunts and ridicule would build layers of muscle like a protective suit of armor. His mother, Jackie, had opened a fitness studio, which she called Barbellas. She moved to Philadelphia after her divorce and shared custody of the boys with their father. And it seemed to me that uh, he was a little scared of his father. Um, I learned later that uh, he was, in fact, afraid of him. And um, he was somewhat like Marlon Brando in The Godfather. I mean, he was a very soft-spoken gentleman, but he had that air about him that uh, if you cross this guy, you know, he could hurt you. Jackie married Tony Felitti, who owned a frozen pizza business. And soon the boys had a baby sister named Tony Ann. Sylvester was getting bigger and stronger, and the four-year age difference with his brother became a problem. He'd pick him up and uh, turn him upside down, put him in an umbrella stand, or else he would stick him in a clothes hamper or hang him in a clothes closet. And a lot of times he would take his sneakers off and tie the laces together. He'd throw them up on the telephone wires in such a way <laughs> he wouldn't be able to get them down. Stallone was becoming a juvenile delinquent. His grades were so bad he was not expected to have much of a future, much less a future as a screenwriter. He changed schools 14 times in 11 years, including a strict Maryland military school. As a last resort, his mother enrolled the 16-year-old in a boarding school for troubled boys, Devereaux Manor Hall. The special attention at that school turned his life around. At Devereaux, the muscular teenager began to excel in sports, and he also started to work with a speech therapist. It wasn't too long before his grades were improving, along with his self-confidence. Stallone earned a sports scholarship to the exclusive American College in Switzerland. Nestled in the Alps, it was a small campus of about 200. Never a serious student, Stallone's reputation was based on what he did outside of class. Well, it was a college, so we did a lot of drinking, uh, but uh, we were up in the Alps, so uh, we were skiing, uh, we were uh, hiking, there was a lot of mountain climbing going on. The insecure boy named Binky had become Michael Stallone, big man on campus. He became the focus of even more attention as the lead in a college production of The Death of a Salesman. But I think that's where he first got the acting bug. Uh, he was very excited about what he was doing. He liked being in front of a lot of people, and he was very comfortable doing it. Stallone had discovered two of his lifelong passions, acting and athletics. He traveled a bit in Europe, surviving a brush with death on a remote Spanish mountaintop, but he was anxious to get on with his life. He returned to America as the anti-war movement was heating up. With a student deferment from the draft, Stallone enrolled at the University of Miami in 1967. Still nursing an acting bug, he signed up for dramatic improvisation. He became the hunchback, drooling, snorting, bruising, bumping into people, wild. The other people actually cleared away, and I'm watching them thinking, this guy's nuts, he's out of his mind. I love him. The two friends shared a love of writing, and they held marathon story writing competitions with each other for up to 48 hours at a time. Stallone also focused on self-improvement. Sly had a slight lift when I met him, and he cured his speech impediment, and he would sit for hours, because we shared. In a, he lived in the closet of my apartment downstairs for a while. When he got thrown out of his apartment, he'd keep this really real tape recorder and he'd just read Walt Whitman over and over again. I sing The Body Electric. I heard that poem over and over. I wanted to strangle him. He'd keep me up at night. Stallone dropped out of college and moved into a $36 a week hotel room in New York City. He worked in a few off-Broadway plays and took a bizarre string of odd jobs to pay the rent. Stallone cleaned lion cages at Central Park Zoo. He sold fish at the Dover Deli and he worked as an usher at the Baronet Theater where he fell in love with a beautiful usherette named Sasha. He and Sasha moved to an apartment on Lexington Avenue, and for the first time, he was using his real name, Sylvester, hoping it would help him stand out from the rest of the crowd. Most agents thought he just looked like another tough guy. One director didn't even think he was good enough to be bad. And we see Woody Allen, and he glances at myself and this fellow named Tony, and he goes, sorry, you're not intimidating enough. I went, hmm. That's a first. OK. But Stallone was determined to convince Woody Allen he was mugger material. 
Then we bought some Vaseline and put it on her face and wiped it off so it had this shine. Then we put some subway soot and messed ourselves up. So we tapped him on the shoulder and went, Hook! And went, oh, perfect. Got the job. Thank you. It was 1971, and Bananas was the 25-year-old actor's first on-screen appearance. Stallone was visiting a friend's acting class when he was spotted by a director about to make the Lords of Flatbush. Frank, I don't want to get married. Really, I don't want to get married. Besides, you're too skinny to be prick. You're too skinny. He added much of his own dialogue to the movie. He was playing a guy who used his swagger and his bravado to disguise a more vulnerable nature, someone a lot like himself. We spent a lot of time together on the Lords of Flatbush. It was like uh, <laughs> somebody would be looking at him in you know, his black leather jacket. He'd go, hey, what is he looking at? You know, I'm going to eat him for breakfast. And I'd say, Sly, probably that's not a great idea. The movie was a modest success, and when Henry Winkler hit it big as Fonzie on the TV show Happy Days, he used his friend Sly for inspiration. It means you got two choices. In the very beginning, when I first uh, got the Fonz, uh, I would think to myself, oh, I wonder what Sly would do. What would Sly do here? Don't ask. His uh, persona uh, helped me form um, the Fonz. The go places, I mean, man, the really go places, you gotta have imagination. No. Sylvester Stallone was about to go places in Hollywood, but he had no idea what a rocky road it was going to be. It was 1974, and the boy from Hell's Kitchen packed up his life and moved to California. Everything was about to change, except for Sasha and his dog, Butkus. The car they were driving gave out in Hollywood. His car broke down on Sunset Boulevard, and he didn't know anybody else in town but me, so he called me up. He said, hey, I got a problem. My car just blew up. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'll be right there. Sly and Sasha married and moved into an apartment off Hollywood Boulevard. Stallone found work in a few movies. He was a gangster in Capone, a gunman in Farewell, My Lovely with Robert Mitchum, and a hapless mugger in Prisoner of Second Avenue with Jack Lemmon. He was finally cast as one of the good guys, a police officer, on the TV show Kojak. I'll tell him just what happened, just like I told Lieutenant Kojak. Go on, Captain, what do you want to know? On Police Story, he shared the screen with another TV tough guy, Chuck Connors. What are you staring at, Elmore? They actually call me Rocky. I really prefer well, that. The ID says Elmore. Elmore Quincy Cato. You think you can carry all that? Uh, Rocky, if you don't mind. Rocky was already more than just a twinkle in the screenwriter's eye. Stallone had been painting that character since 1973. He was done with uh, hands and a screwdriver, and I didn't know exactly where to go with Rocky, so I couldn't put it into words, so I tried to put it visually and try to get his countenance, his feeling, his musculature, and then work my way into being more verbal. But the story finally fell into place in 1975 when he saw Muhammad Ali pummel a second-rate boxer named Chuck Wepner. He had already managed to impress a couple of Hollywood producers with his writing. We had an idea about uh, doing a, a fight movie, and he said, I've been, I have a great fight movie. I, I think if we had told him we wanted to do a movie about pushing up daisies, he would have had a great pushing up daisies idea. Uh, because he was pretty hungry in those days. He didn't have any money, and he lived in a small flat. It was tough on him. He offered to write the story for free if he were given the starring role. It was an audacious proposal for an out-of-work actor, but the producers agreed. He worked around the clock at his Hollywood apartment to write the classic story of a Cinderella in sweatpants. Three and a half days later, he emerged with a script that the producers loved. The financier, on the other hand, said they wanted us to get Burt Reynolds or Ryan O'Neill. They were kind of the two hot guys at the moment. And they said they would make the film, but not with Stallone. And they said, no, no, we said, wait a minute, that's not our understanding. We've got to make it with him. The studio decided to make the unknown screenwriter an offer he probably couldn't refuse. Big money. 50 bucks. Sasha was expecting a baby, and Sly was so broke, he was about to sell his beloved Butkus to pay the utility bill. The studio offered him $360,000 to give up the story. Sly and Sasha turned down the money, essentially risking their family's future on a movie. Butkus! Hey, Bunkin, give it a kid. To keep you company when you run. Oh, 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 oh,
Ironically, it would take an underdog's mentality to make a movie about Rocky, the ultimate underdog. Even their own crew was treating the cast like they were second rate. Some of the various crew members on that set, they were kind of, oh, well, maybe embarrassed, you know, who, who the hell, who, 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 who are these people they were working with? And, you know, they, you know during a, a take or the people are putting something away or they're talking about other things, you know? And I remember Sylvester saying, but they don't know. Nobody knows what they're making here. He did. You know, he kept that belief. Stallone also had the struggle to keep the pieces of his story together. The producers were running out of money, even though one of the most important scenes in the movie had yet to be shot. So the producers said, well, it's nice, but we don't have time to film it. <laughs> you don't understand. It's the soul. It's the Achilles heel. It is the Cyclops' eye. It is something you can't do without you. <laughs> it's, it's it, you know. I mean, who am I kidding? I ain't even in the guy's league. And he said, well, we just don't have any time. And I'm, now I'm so nervous. And I said, please, you gotta, give, you, 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 you gotta uh, let, let, let me have this one shot. He goes, okay, one take. And now my nerves are frayed. I, I'm on the line. And the character is supposed to be worn out and tired. Because there was nobody before. Don't say that. Oh, come on, Adrian, it's true. There was nobody. And I had like a pint of Boone's Farm wine that's like 89 cents, and it comes with like, it comes with band aids because your liver is going to explode. You know what I mean? It, it, it comes with a doctor's address on the side. And I, I drank this and went, oh, okay, now I understand. Punchy, I'm right back into it. I'm dizzy, I'm feeling down and disoriented. So I went in, one take, you're, you're just gonna do it. See, and that bell rings, and I'm still standing. for the first time in my life, see? That I weren't just another bum from the neighborhood. He said, cut, take. Next day, the producers came out. Sly, that's our favorite scene. I went, thank God. Rocky opened in theaters and became a phenomenal hit, turning Sylvester Stallone into a worldwide sensation. Critics called it overly sentimental, but the Million Dollar Movie made $160 million at the box office and came to be considered a classic. At the age of 30, the boy from Hell's Kitchen was suddenly famous, enormously wealthy, and on the verge of making Hollywood history. Rocky was nominated for 10 Academy Awards that year with stiff competition like Taxi Driver, Network, and All the President's Men. It won three major awards, including Best Picture. Rocky Irwin, Winkler, and Robert Chardoff, producers. In an unusual move, producer Irwin Winkler pulled Stallone on stage to share their triumphant moment. And to all the Rockies in the world, I love you. Thank you. Backstage, Stallone was flippant and ecstatic. Sylvester, a great number of fans have asked me to ask you if I met you, how you pronounce your last name. They, they say Stallone, Stallone, and Stallion. Which one do you prefer? Schwartz. <laughs> Stallone. What do, you, what do you call yourself, Stallone? Stallone. With a heavyweight movie under his belt, Sylvester Binky Stallone was a Hollywood contender. He knew he could overcome failure, but he had yet to learn whether he could manage what success had in store. It was 1977, and Sylvester Stallone was on top of the Hollywood heat. But he was going to have trouble staying there. Overwhelming fame made him overconfident. Suddenly, he was in demand everywhere and his family life began to suffer. Soon after Rocky won the Oscar for Best Picture, Sly stepped up to bat as a union leader in the movie Fist. The movie was about the rise and fall of a labor leader who became powerful and corrupt by linking organized labor with organized crime. 
Sly beefed up for the part, and the makeup department tried to make him age 30 years. I don't drink it, I don't just hear it, 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 Oh, my lot of it, it, and all my stuff, it, it, it. Critical opinion was divided. The Hollywood trade press said Stallone was strong and dynamic. But the movie was also called big, bold, and botched. If it was a sophomore curse, Sly barely had time to notice. He was already on location for his next big movie, Paradise Alley. Where'd you want this houseboat again? Houseboat in Jersey. Houseboat in Jersey. Well, listen, wrestling could be your passport out of the city real soon. It's a growing sport, I'm telling you. The story took place in Hell's Kitchen in 1946, the same year he was born. Sly wrote, directed, and starred in the film. And you better take a look at me, because I'm on my way uptown. It's uptown for Cosmo. Working so long on location began to take a toll on his family. Sly and his wife, Sasha, separated, and he began a romance with his co-star, Joyce Ingalls. The problem is, Bunch, it's just that nothing in my life is working right anymore. What am I, a broken part? Paradise Alley was the closest thing to Stallone's heart since Rocky. And he was hurt by negative reviews, which called it a crazy collage. But he bounced back to his winning formula and wrote a sequel to Rocky. I can get another job if I want it, you know? But do I want I mean, do I want to be doing something I ain't going to be happy doing? Plus, you know, we need the money now, Buckus. He also went back to his wife, Sasha, in an attempt to patch up things at home. I was wondering if uh, you wouldn't mind marrying me very much. What'd you say? If you wouldn't mind marrying me too much. Yes. I'd like to marry you. Adrian became pregnant in the movie, and in real life, so did Sasha. She later gave birth to their second son, Sergio, a brother for Sage. Would you sign it, please, to uh, my good friend? In the movie, Rocky would face the kind of overnight fame and fortune Stallone had learned about firsthand. It's my first autograph. Thank you. You're welcome. The critics weren't thrilled, but Rocky II went on to make $125 million and became one of the most successful sequels in history. He invented sequels. He, he invented the whole sequel business as we know it today. I mean, he laid the groundwork for a, a, another whole business, another whole part of, of the industry that didn't exist prior to that. Career-wise, things were getting back on track. But privately, Stallone was riding an emotional roller coaster. He and Sasha had split up again. She filed for divorce while he made headlines with the leggy blonde actress Susan Anton. Meanwhile, Stallone felt he was on a treadmill to nowhere with his next two movies, Nighthawks and the wartime film Victory. When I was born, he was never there. You know, he was always working. He never had time to spend with his kids. You know, we'd have to go see him on the set. Stallone was lonely for his family. Soon his on-again, off-again marriage to Sasha was back on. His appearance began to change. Stallone sculpted his body and underwent minor surgery to improve his drooping eye. By the time he returned to Rocky, he looked more like a matinee idol than a boxer. In the opposite corner, he weighs in at a trim 201 pounds, Rocky Balboa. Stallone had been criticized for making boxing seem too brutal, but he thought realism was an important element, and he didn't change his approach at all this time around. I would try it two ways. One, going all the way to the end, but dipping out when we get back to real time. Okay. Rocky III rewrote Hollywood history again. Sequels weren't expected to do better than their originals, but this one did, making nearly $200 million worldwide. Oh, absolutely. Other stars were paying attention. I thought Rocky III had this kind of fresh uh, life to it, and I felt that he knew he was the master of making a sequel work. John Travolta chose Stallone to write and direct his sequel to the disco classic Saturday Night Fever called Staying Alive. Sly added his usual touch by writing about things he had experienced firsthand, like having once been so broke he had to wash his clothes while showering. 
Sly put so much of himself into the script, he finally put himself into the movie. Yeah, I mean, it's a very popular thing, and I think I remember the audiences going nuts over it when we bumped into each other. That was his idea. The audience loved it. They screamed when he was on. The premiere for Staying Alive was a fundraiser for autistic research. It was one of the early public acknowledgments of a devastating personal tragedy. Stallone's three-year-old son, Sergio, had been diagnosed as autistic. Well, when you find out your son is pretty much impaired for life and it comes out suddenly, there, there was, a, again, a sense of helplessness and then great wrath, anger whatever you want to call it, I, I felt um, betrayed by God. And we all say, well, it's, it's you know, God's will, and this is the way it should be, and, and uh, it, we, we become stronger from it. I don't believe that. I think you become weaker from it. I think your life is shattered, and, and I don't understand what the lesson is. Eventually, the Stallone's 11-year marriage collapsed under the strain, and they finally decided to divorce. Sasha received child support and a $32 million settlement. Sly was already reaching out for the most controversial and most violent character of his career. Action. Just these first three or four this rounds. Is, this is a dummy, right? Yeah. That makes two of us. In the 1980s, Sylvester Stallone invented himself as an action hero for the first time with three Rambo films. John Rambo was a barrel-chested superhero in army boots. Look at me, I'm scarred up, I'm beat up, I had collisions. Who survived countless enemies and even managed to outwit sophisticated weaponry. We have uh, four Russian MiG jets that will come whipping through this valley. The four planes at the same level. Rambo's simple solution to complex problems transcended language barriers and appealed to fans all over the world, including politicians. And in the spirit of Rambo, let me tell you, we're going to win this time. But the Rambo reaction was not entirely positive. The late peace activist Jerry Rubin was one of those who picketed theaters in the 80s. I thought it was one of the worst movies I ever saw, and I'm pretty objective. And I really can't even think of one bit of redeeming social value in the movie. For people to think that it, uh, that it really is meant to be um, an honest evaluation of, of, of solutions to problems in the world today is, is a, little, it's a little ridiculous. No, I'm, if we can get back to, he says, isn't the war finally over for you for today? In 1982, First Blood was Stallone's first blockbuster hit apart from Rocky. Ironically, when the star saw an early rough cut of the film, he thought he had made a terrible mistake. It was horrifying. And it was so dark that at times I wanted to go up and feel the screen if we were there. I mean, I, didn't, I, know, there's, I know there's movement, I hear it, but I can't see it. It was that dark, it was a rainforest. <laughs> so afterwards, I turned to Ron Meyer, my agent. Don't push it. He was almost on the floor, and he goes, do you want to throw up first, or should I do it? And I said, it is pretty bad. He goes, it's horrible. After that initial panic, the movie was turned into a winner. Let me come in and get you the hell out of there. They drew first blood, not me. Stallone made three and a half million dollars for first blood, but the two Rambo sequels brought him more than 10 times that amount. Thanks for including me. $36 million. <sighs> Most stars are lucky to create one movie hero. Stallone was now linked with two indelible icons. But one of his personal heroes was a world away from either Rocky or Rambo. Oh, cuff. Hey, Link, what are you drowning down there? You know, you got to imagine, this is a guy that was teaching himself a new word each day so he could understand Edgar Allan Poe. He knows everything about Poe's life. He's fanatic about Edgar Allan Poe. And I, when I first met him, I thought, Rocky reading Poe. It's <laughs> an interesting picture, you know? But he, he knows about his life. He knows about his death. He, he has a story about how he really died. Searching for another creative outlet, Stallone began to paint in earnest. He explored his two alter egos, Rocky and Rambo. Rambo is trying to run from his inner self. He's running from his own demons. A very prominent part of Sly's personality is the dark side. People think of him as his gloaming light of optimism. He's a sun rising, when actually 
a lot of what Sly is, is the sun setting and going down and keep going down. I mean, that's a lot in his artwork. You know, they're very strange, depraved, dysfunctional creatures in his work. Though dark, his paintings proved to be popular, selling in the mid five figures. What's easiest for you, acting or painting? Painting is easier because you can always uh, uh, take the canvas and throw it away and the movie stays with you forever. <laughs> One of the movies Stallone probably wanted to disappear was 1984's Rhinestone, co-starring Dolly Parton. He played a singing cab driver. Rhinestone was a tremendous disappointment to him. It was somewhat of an experiment. It was taking him out of character. I think he did things that were somewhat shocking to people uh, to think that the same person who played Rocky and Rambo uh, also played this character in Rhinestone. Stallone responded to the movie's failure by going back to his tried and true champion in Rocky IV. This time, Rocky knocked out the entire Soviet system. Punch amazing willpower. Neither man backing off. Who loves it? He put his new girlfriend in the movie, a 22-year-old actress named Brigitte Nielsen. You have this belief that you are better than us. You have this belief that this country is so very good. She had managed an introduction to the star by sending him a provocative photo of herself. Rocky IV turned out to be the biggest Rocky ever, weighing in at more than $278 million worldwide. In 1985, Sly and Brigitte married. They made one more movie, the ultra-violent Cobra, but the Stallone's tumultuous marriage turned into a tabloid spectacle. Rumors were circulating about her infidelity with partners of both sexes. Though both Brigitte and Sly denied the rumors, he filed for divorce in less than two years. Stung by the breakup of his second marriage, Stallone admitted the whole thing had happened too fast. Never alone for long, Stallone dated a string of women. What's Rico Suave doing on set? Come on. <laughs> until he met a beautiful 18-year-old named Jennifer Flavin. In public, he created a frenzy that even his ever-present bodyguards could not control. Nice looking approach, John. Sly took up polo playing with a passion. It was also his father's favorite sport, and they ponied up against each other for a memorable match. Oh, there it is. It's the two Stallones coming together. Let's... Stallone has always had a complex relationship with his father. Playing polo seemed to bring out their father-son rivalry. Uh, here comes Sylvester. Little contact with the opposing player. He a whistle. The first cheap shot and only cheap shot in the game was administered from my father to his son. Now, if that isn't biblical. If I really did what I did, uh, uh, you know, just in part of the game. Either you take it or you don't. I was expecting it. At least he didn't score the goal. That I couldn't live with. Sly later gave up polo in favor of golf. The beauty of the sport is that I'm never unhappy because at the end of every game, I go, thank God I didn't choose this for a living. <laughs> he became a fanatic golfer, but the action hero was also beginning to pay a steep price for putting so much of his own movie muscle where his mouth was. I broke my nose twice, collarbone, knuckles, hands, ankles. I broke uh, my collarbone twice again. I've cracked my vertebrae, cheekbone, feet. I might crack my patilla. It sounds like a symphony of walnuts in the morning. <laughs> Castanets, anyone? Yeah, I'm getting brutal as it is. Kid, tell Sly went back to Rocky one more time in 1990. The low-budget feature that had given birth to an entire career now earned him another $30 million for the final installment. His son, Sage, played Rocky's son in the movie. I pierced my ear, and I put an earring with a chain, and he saw that chain hanging from my ear. It wasn't a good day for me, okay? What do you think? You me? You look like the daughter that I always wanted. Wait, <laughs> In 1991, Stallone joined forces with two other Hollywood megastars, Arnold Schwarzenegger and Bruce Willis, for Planet Hollywood. The franchise was a brilliant marriage of publicity and commerce. He has an incredible sense of humor. I mean, he is just hilarious. He'll have you cry and laugh and telling you stories. Stallone tried to capitalize on his sense of humor with the comedies Oscar and Stop or My Mom Will Shoot, but moviegoers weren't laughing. 
So in 1993, Stallone returned to the kind of spine-tingling adventure his audience had come to expect. Cliffhanger was a monster hit. Sly did the majority of those stunts himself. Uh, he was hanging out there in the, in the middle of nowhere, hooked by some wires, uh, climbing those mountains. I mean, it was pretty extraordinary. He gave up experimenting and continued giving audiences what they wanted in another action thriller, Demolition Man. His co-star was an unknown starlet named Sandra Bullock. Ain't she great? Oh, yeah. A real trooper. I hate that word. I'm sorry, a real else. pooper. That's great. Thank you. Is that better? That's better. Thank the two stars clearly hit it off and even managed to get into a little trouble in between takes. This dress was made out of little glass beads and, and by a jeweler, and it was a gorgeous dress. And, <laughs> and there was a handbag that went along with it in the same material. And once again, it was late at night when, when Sly and I had obviously peaked on energy. And he goes, here, let's play your dress. So I sort of put my hands over my head and I posed as like the, the washboard. And he took the purse and he started rubbing it. And we were singing and um, it cheered everyone up. But the next day, he comes up to me, he goes, oh, I think we're a little bit of trouble. <laughs> I said, why? He goes, because apparently this dress cost $30,000 to make. Great. And by him playing the dress and me being the instrument, we destroyed the bottom half of the dress. Like, you're gonna see the scratches on the bottom of these little glass pebbles was my response. He added another $12 million to his bank account in The Specialist with Sharon Stone. The reason I signed up on this tour of duty, actually. <laughs> but his love life was unraveling. When another woman claimed he had fathered her child, Stallone broke up with Jennifer and decided to support the baby. By the time the dust had settled and a blood test proved that Stallone was not the baby's real father, Jennifer had returned to her modeling career. <laughs> Judge Dredd was dead on arrival in theaters, but he was already busy at work on Assassins with Antonio Banderas. Sly knew he would never completely escape action roles. He took on Daylight, another physically demanding role. I think he's been typecast somewhat, but I'm not sure that's the worst thing that's ever happened. You know, I think he, he is a, a true action hero. In 1996, Stallone was a global superstar. Two decades had passed since Rocky. Gonna stick this face on a stamp, what do you think? And he marked the anniversary with a postage stamp issued in five countries. Huh? It was a sentimental tribute to a well-loved star. Sly's romantic life was about to come full circle. He reunited with his longtime love, Jennifer Flavin, and in 1996, she gave birth to their daughter, Sophia Rose. Her prominent heart surgeon discovered the baby had a life-threatening ailment. She was in very severe heart failure, and uh, she was not growing. Stallone, who already had an autistic son, felt an extra measure of grief and responsibility. Both he and Jennifer stayed round the clock at the hospital. Sylvester Stallone is, uh, in private, he's extraordinarily sensitive, uh, which again, you would not expect from the, the macho action hero type of uh, personality that people have come to expect. To everyone's relief, Sophia recovered completely. For Stallone, it was a spiritual reawakening. It's one thing to have a child, which is a glorious miracle, then to have a, uh, a child recover from death's door. I, it's like uber miracle, ultra miracle. And then, so I, I renewed my faith in man, in man's skill. I renewed my faith in uh, modern day miracles. I renewed my faith in a lot of things. And it kind of, and then with Jennifer, uh, it, it really took love to a, a new level, a plateau that I have never been before. So I, um, I have to thank that little Sophia Rose that. Sylvester Stallone was determined to refocus his life, and he knew exactly where he was going to start. Sylvester, will you love her, comfort her?
By the spring of 1997, Sylvester Stallone had been at the top of his profession for 20 years. And now he was ready to mark another milestone. He and Jennifer Flavin married. I will. Jennifer, you've taken Sylvester to be your husband. Will you love him? To ensure privacy, Stallone wanted a secret and spontaneous wedding. I said, just have your wedding dress ready at all times. So she's walking around like six weeks with this dress in it. In, faith, in the bag, says, today? No, not today. Today? I said, I'll let you know. He arranged for an intimate yet elaborate storybook wedding at Blenheim Palace outside London, England, where Winston Churchill was born. Like everything else in the superstar's orbit, it was more than merely ordinary. Anybody who I'd like to thank finding the most treasured woman on Earth, anyone who's just put up with me and persevered. <laughs> Professionally, Stallone was about to set off in another direction. He packed down 40 pounds to star in the dramatic film Copland. I'm watching. I can see that. You got a crime rate here of about what? Uh, Lowest in northern New Jersey. In this movie, he didn't share the screen with any spine-tingling special effects, but with Robert De Niro one of the greatest actors of his generation. You came to me, to my town, with all these speeches, and you were talking to me about doing the right thing, and I'm doing the right thing. What's going on? What are you doing? Oh, well, like two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. This one, uh, he was doing a, uh, another type of acting, a so-called more serious, quote, unquote, serious acting. No, no, listen to me. You're IA. That's why I came to you. You can do whatever you want. Remember you came to me and said, you want to be a cop? I'm being a listen cop now. I'm here. I'm I asking offered you, you a for chance. some help. I need to do something listen for you. I need he to was do this. trying listen to do something else in Copland, and um, I thought he was, I thought he was pretty good, and more than pretty good. It was a delicate balancing act. Stallone knew he was a valuable commercial commodity, his name above the title in an action movie could guarantee millions. But after 25 years in show business, he wanted to turn back the clock. In the best of worlds would be to do the things that are expected and then to do something that is um, knowingly going to meet with a little skepticism, but it's, it's not a financial risk of its sorts, and you're not putting anyone else on the limb. You're not insisting on doing something that is going to cause the studio embarrassment and, and uh, any kind of uh, financial loss. So to go from big, small, big, small, big, small, that would be the ultimate, and that's what I'm trying to accomplish. I mean, Sylvester does those kind of movies. We understand that. Uh, uh, that's okay. No, no, it's okay. He was beginning to show a refreshing sense of humility and self-effacing humor. Seemingly, he was a man who had everything. Wealth, love, and a second chance at fatherhood. Stallone is unable to travel anywhere in the world without being recognized. He has achieved a longevity and a popularity that few stars will ever match. I thought, okay, we'll go in. It's say hello to the people, whatever, my God. But I didn't expect that. The challenge now will be to maintain his commercial viability while striving to achieve what he expects of himself. Wouldn't it be great to be without secrets at the end of one's life, to be secretless? You, you, there is no mystery. You've done it, you've conquered it, you've seen it. And you can go to your grave saying, next.